Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show, bringing you another really fascinating guest today, helping to create a better tomorrow. Uh, today, we have the honor of being joined by Dr. Andrew Hebler, who is Principal Assistant Director for Health and Life Sciences at the Office of Science and Technology Policy at the White House, uh, and there he has extensive foreign affairs, national security, global health, and science and technology policy experience that he puts to work. Uh, most recently, Dr. Hebler was senior director and lead scientist for global biologic policy and programs at the nonprofit Nuclear Threat Initiative. And previous to that, he served in leadership positions at the State Department's Offices of Science and Technology Cooperation, the Science and Technology Advisor of the Secretary of State and Cooperative Threat Reduction Agency. Um, from 2013 to 2015, Dr. Hebler was Assistant Director for Biological and Chemical Threats at the Obama's White House uh, Office of Science and Technology Policy, and there he oversaw uh, American science and technology efforts to combat infectious disease, chemical weapons threats, and prior to his White House position, uh, he led the State Department's Biosecurity Engagement Program, which is a $40 million program uh, that endeavored to prevent terrorist access to potentially dangerous biologic materials and dual-use infrastructure expertise, ultimately, while supporting efforts to combat infectious disease and enhance public health and animal health worldwide. Uh, Dr. Hebler received his uh, bachelor's degree in biology and philosophy from Thomas More College. He did his uh, doctoral work in molecular microbiology and immunology uh, in the laboratory of uh, C. David Pauz at the University of Maryland, where he focused on understanding a really interesting and unconventional lymphocyte population uh, important during immune response to infectious disease and cancer. Uh, and then before he joined the State Department, he did a post doc uh, in the laboratory of uh, Warner Green at the, uh, the Gladstone Institute in San Francisco. Uh, a lot of very interesting things to get into today. Uh, Dr. Andrew Hebler, thank you so much for taking the time to come on our show. Ira, thank you uh, so much for having me. And I think the older you get, the longer those introductions get. So uh, 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 I think it's more a testament by age than maybe experience, but we'll, we'll see as we get into it. Yeah, it, we definitely will see, but I, I think it's all, you're deserving of it all. It, it's, a, it's a fascinating path that you've been on, Andrew. Um, I, I'd love to start off just for a couple of minutes as we typically do, just by uh, having you talk about sort of when and where it all began. If you could sort of take us back a little bit about you, where you grew up, when you got interested in, in STEM, in biology, and, and a little bit of your development of your interest in, in public health. I think that'd be a great way to, to get things going. That's great. Um, so happy to do that. So I think the best place to start the story is at the beginning. So I'm originally from uh, Kentucky, uh, Northern Kentucky. So just across the river from Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, and I grew up uh, very much a child of the eighties. Um, I went to high school in the Northern Kentucky area. Um, I actually went to college in the Northern Kentucky area. Um, and it wasn't really until, I had always been interested in science, but it wasn't really until um, I arrived at college that I really began to sharpen um, sort of my interests in um, science and technology broadly, but more specifically biology um, and public health. Um, and so I went to a small liberal arts school in Northern Kentucky called, at the time called Thomas More College. It's now called Thomas More University. Um, and I double majored in biology and philosophy. I think early on, I thought I had this big plan to go into bioethics, but that plan uh, sort of merging the biology and philosophy, but that plan um, quickly uh, went awry when I took my first immunology class. Um, I literally just fell in love with not just um, the idea of the immune system, but um, really the 
all of the just fascinating ways that and words that we had um, come up with to describe the way this really complicated um, system worked to both protect and sometimes uh, 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 negatively affect uh, human health um, and just fell in love with immunology. And I had the good fortune of having a really amazing um, professor uh, mentor in my undergraduate uh, training who was actually the teacher of this immunology course and um, through a series of discussions um, went to her and said, what should I do with the rest of my life? Um, and she suggested I consider uh, pursuing uh, doctoral work uh, in, in immunobiology and in, in, in immunology. Um, I will say I had always been interested in public health broadly. I, like I said, I was very much a child of the 80s and sort of the earliest me memories I have of being conscious of sort of the broader public and political discourse um, was the emergence of um, the HIV virus in the 1980s. Um, and so that very much uh, dominated my uh, consciousness, uh, dominated much of our um, political focus uh, here in the United States during that time. Um, but it was, you know, I, I, I came of age in college at the time where we were um, beginning to see some of the benefits of our investments in science and in um, uh, antivirals to treat HIV infection. Um, and at this time, while I was discovering immunology, was had, had essentially become sort of the resident HIV biology expert um, at my uh, school. Um, so, and it was really that that uh, began to propel me initially onto, onto the path of pursuing um, what, what ultimately became a PhD in microbiology uh, and immunology. Um, and... You know, if, if, if we can go there for a moment, because, you know, I took a little time to go into some of the uh, the papers that you were publishing uh, at University of Maryland and, and at Gladstone. And you really, Andrew, you were working at this really an intersection of really two fascinating topics at the time. Um, you know, you were focusing on um, the topic of HIV latency, uh, the molecular biology behind it, uh, the respective reservoirs of, of this HIV latency. At the same time, um, you were also publishing on this, as I mentioned in the intro, this really unique subset of immune cells. And we're, you know, we're just learning even today so much more about the immune system, these, these gamma delta cells, which sort of hold an interesting place somewhere in between the innate and adaptive immune response. The reason I'm bringing this up, not just because it's amazing work that you were involved in, but I just, a couple of weeks ago, I happened to do an episode focusing on the um, uh, the City of Hope patient, uh, patient number four with the, uh, uh, the um, HIV resistant stem cell transplant cure. Um, clearly a, a fascinating area of, of biology in its own right, but not something that is gonna be the cure for many people. Um, and it brings me back to sort of your work because clearly the domain of HIV latency and reservoirs is, you know, where I see a lot of sort of the focus on, hey, this is what we ultimately got to wipe out to, to cure this thing. Um, just looking back for 15 years now when you're first working on this, because you're clearly at the, <laughs> the forefront of it then, where do you think we're going with, with this particular segment uh, in terms of moving beyond the therapeutics we have to some novel might be less expensive and less invasive curative interventions, Richard. Yeah. Well, Ira, these are all all great questions. Um, maybe the the first thing I'll say is what drew me just to this area. Um, and well, maybe I'll say to begin um, to all of the, the viewers out there what I'm what I'm going to be describing for the next uh, well 45 minutes or so sounds like a great story. Sounds very premeditated. Um, has turned into to uh, uh, at least a, what feels like a linear narrative, but it didn't feel linear at the time. Um, and literally um, everything I'm describing and most of the steps over the last 20 years of my career have just been a function of following my interest and not really knowing where it led, um, but just trying to take stock of the things that are important to me and putting myself in situations where I felt like I was learning and I was interested in the subject matter and most importantly um, was surrounded by people that um, I respected and that I felt like I could learn from. Um, and literally all of the steps, um, I, as I was transitioning, people would say, you were crazy. Why are you moving from Kentucky to Baltimore? We have a university in Lexington. When I moved from Baltimore to San Francisco for my postdoc, people would say, why are you moving to San Francisco? It's so expensive. You should stay here on the East Coast. So um, really, um, everything I'm going to describe today might sound like a good story, but it really is just a function of, of following my interests. Um, I wouldn't have been able to articulate it at the time, but looking back now, 
I realized that one of the things that really has always motivated me uh, is not um, understanding the, uh, something in the most amount of detail, like one tiny thing and working out that mechanism. I know there are people that are really focused on diving deep. Um, and I'm so thankful for people like that. I am not one of those people. What I've always been drawn to are problems that span sectors or that require a variety of um, uh, disciplines or expertise in order to actually have a meaningful impact. So part of what drew me to just my um, where I ended up doing my doctoral work, which, which was at the Institute of Human Virology, um, which is um, on the University of Maryland, uh, Baltimore's campus, uh, was the fact that I happened to read in the band played on by Randy Schultz. Um, and Bob Gallo was a key figure in that book. And I had happened to read that Bob Gallo had been recruited by the University of Maryland um, to start this institute. And what was remarkable about this institute at the time is it didn't take a single discipline approach to HIV. It took a comprehensive approach. And so what was uh, fascinating to me about the opportunity to do my doctoral work in Baltimore at the Institute of Human Virology was the fact that in the same building, you had the groups of people that were focused on dissecting the basic science of HIV infection, understanding the virology and latency and immunology. You had groups of people that were focused on really understanding public health and epidemiology, not just here in the United States, but also in places that were impacted around the world, mainly in Sub-Saharan Africa. You had groups that were focused on clinical care, translating the basic science findings to actual patients. You had animal modeling divisions that were trying to come up with new ways to uh, more more um, accurately assess uh, or study HIV infection. Um, and all of this was happening atop a clinic that was treating HIV-infected Baltimoreans. Um, and I just love the idea of being in this multidisciplinary environment. So my doctoral work was, uh, what I think what, was, what drew me to it was, again, the focus on uh, really trying to understand the immune response to HIV infection. And what was a new idea to me at the time, which I, I hadn't known, that there was a, um, a, a disproportionate link between HIV infection and certain types of cancer. Um, and I really wanted to try and understand not just um, what caused that link, but whether we could devise immunological or in, immunobiology-based approaches um, that could reverse it or to treat it. Um, and so that's really how I spent my six to seven years um, in, in Baltimore. Um, and what drew me to my postdoctoral work in San Francisco was exactly what you described at, at the outset here. It was really uh, recognizing that, and at that time we had no patients, no proofs of principle that you could actually eradicate HIV infection from humans. But um, the, the idea that if you could understand how HIV established this latent state that maybe you could trick HIV into waking up and eliminating it. So it was just an idea at that time. Um, and so, you know, what I, again, what I, looking back, what I liked was the, the, the multidisciplinary focus. I liked spending some time really dissecting and understanding one part of the immunological response to HIV. And I loved turning my attention in my postdoc to the virus itself and really trying to understand the molecular mechanisms um, that HIV uh, encoded and utilized in order to establish this persistent um, chronic uh, state that even to this day has been so difficult um, to, to uh, reverse. I think, you know, you mentioned the four patients. We now have clear proof of principle that it is possible um, uh, conceptually and with, at great cost to eliminate HIV infection from infected individuals. Um, and while that, um, that proof of principle gives us great hope, it still doesn't lend itself at this moment to the types of solutions that um, can be widely implemented around the world in uh, low resource settings. And so I think that's, that's really um, where, where the focus of the field is. How do we do this? How do we do it cheaply? And how do we do it in a way that's easily replicable um, in all parts of the world. And I, I have great hope it's going to happen. It's just a matter of time. Um, and we've made tremendous uh, uh, progress. Um, but, you know, when I look at my time at the bench, these are the kinds of kinds of things that, um, I don't know, that now looking back really are important to me.
Yeah, I, I thought it was extremely remarkable just think, looking at this and saying, well, this is 15 years ago and you were thinking about, once again, this uh, you thought about the intersection and sort of the cross-disciplinary uh, requirements here, but working at this fascinating intersection of, uh, of HIV, of oncology, it just, it would just, it struck me as just, you know, very timely <laughs> for well, 2022. So. Yeah, let me make one other comment, and this is something that I reflect on quite a lot. It while while we've made tremendous progress, and I loved the you know I loved all of my time in the research lab. Really, what propelled me into the lab um, was uh, in part uh, an article that was published by Andrew Sullivan in the New York Times Magazine, I believe, in the early probably 1994, just as a, as highly active antiretroviral therapies were entering the the marketplace, um, and it was the the cover story of the New York Times Magazine. And the name, the title of the story was When Plagues End. And I think if there's one idea that's really been a thread through my whole career, it's been this fascination that science and technology can actually um, create a way to essentially take pandemics off the table as a threat to society. And what, you know, the thesis of Andrew Sullivan's article was, was essentially in the, for the first time in human history, within um, two decades, 15 years, we had did first detected the, a, a new threat emerge in the human population. We had mobilized the um, US and global scientific system to dissect its biology sufficiently enough that we could develop therapeutic interventions that actually um, didn't take HIV off the table as a threat to humanity. Obviously it still to this day uh, causes tremendous hardship for many around the world, but have transformed HIV from a, a death sentence to a chronic manageable illness. Um, and you know, as I look at my work in the, the policy arena over the last 10 plus years, it's really that idea that we, the capabilities, um, the science and technology capabilities to take, to stop outbreaks before they become epidemics or pandemics, before they become the next global HIV or COVID, are within our reach, that it's just a matter of um, finding the right alignment between political will, um, resources, um, and uh, sustained focus um, to, um, to develop these capabilities. So again, it's, it's that concept that I think that, that, that has been a central part of my career, that is science and technology can create really um, important solutions that can um, radically promote human health and um, economic development. And, you know, continuing along those lines, um, in your responsibilities at the State Department as Chief of the Biosecurity Engagement Program, but also uh, at OSTP um, under the President Obama, where you're Director for Biological and Chemical Threats, uh, a main theme obviously is, is put into your purview of, you know, dual use, uh, dual use concepts, ultimately how we reduce the risk of bad things happening by bad people, whether it's bioterrorism, agroterrorism, what have you, uh, in these crossover areas. Um, and I, I happen to go on YouTube and watch um, a talk you gave at the end of 2014. It was the National Academies of Medicine mm -hmm. and a symposium on uh, gain of function. Uh, and, and something known as, um, at the time, you, were, you, you took some time to go through what was known as the deliberative process, uh, where uh, you, know, you brought together the National Academies, uh, the National Science Advisory Board for Biosecurity, and really a comprehensive program of how you take something uh, like gain of function research, which is on one hand, can just do amazing things for the future for us and human health. On the other hand, put in the wrong hands, it can do some really bad stuff. Talk about a little bit about this time, if you would, and, and, and a little, if you could walk through, I know you did a whole presentation on this, but what is a deliberative process? Can you talk a little bit about what goes into that? Yeah, so let me um, tackle these in two parts, and maybe I'll focus a little bit of time on what got me into the State Department and my work there, and then Please. maybe turn some attention to the the work I did um, here in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy during the Obama administration. So um, I think, you know, what I realized very quickly when I arrived in my postdoc, which was uh, literally one of the, I was at the Gladstone Institutes, which is on the University of California, San Francisco campus, one of the most amazing institutes for me, surrounded by the most committed, smartest people with one of the most wonderful PIs, Warner Green, 
Um, and But recognized very quickly that laboratory research was not really the path for me, um, and that I really needed to find a way that, to connect with some kind of career path that would allow me to essentially take science, apply the findings of science and technology to promote health. Um, and I remember the day I, I, as I was searching, and I, I you know, put a, talked to a lot of people about different paths you could take with a sort of PhD in science. Um, and I remember the day I came across the felt the Science and Technology Policy Fellowship that's sponsored by the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Um, in many ways, the skies opened up and angels started singing. And I remember looking at um, all of the characteristics that AAAS said would make you a good fellow. And I thought, this is like, this was designed for me. <laughs> um, and I thought for sure when I applied, uh, uh, if I got the fellowship, that where I would end up is at a place like CDC or even potentially the U.S. Agency for International Development doing public health capacity building. But again, um, following my interests what, in making a uh, somewhat long story short, um, ended up connecting with an office at the State Department. I knew the State Department existed in the universe, but I didn't really have an idea of what it focused on, um, and landed in an office called Cooperative Threat Reduction in a bureau called International Security and Nonproliferation. Um, and really what drew me to this part of the State Department was not any understanding whatsoever of nonproliferation or weapons of mass destruction or dual use um, issues, but was really the recognition that what I wanted to do was international public health capacity building. Didn't really know what that meant at the time, but could say those words because it sounded like what the kind of thing that I was looking for, but you could do it through a security lens. And I thought, wow, that's really interesting. I could, you know, I've spent my career doing research and just thinking about, you know, infectious diseases as a health issue. This might be a really awesome opportunity to think about other ways, other perspectives on infectious diseases. And so, you know, I learned very quickly in joining this office and becoming part of what is now a three decade legacy um, of cooperative threat re reduction programs in the United States, which were in very brief, um, a set of programs launched by Senators Nunn and Luger after the fall of the Soviet Union in the early 1990s that were aimed at, basically aimed at redirecting former Soviet weapon scientists so that their biological, chemical, and nuclear weapons expertise was being used for pe peaceful civilian applications and not for the development of weapons. And as those um, programs evolved over time, and particularly as they evolved after September 11th, where we began to recognize that it wasn't just state-based threats that posed a, a major threat to our national security, but really non-state actors and individuals who were intent on causing harm um, could exploit the tools of modern biology to, to do that, um, began to recognize that a lot of the ways that we had approached former Soviet scientist engagement and former weapon scientist engagement um, provided a helpful way to think about using science cooperation as a way to work with life scientists around the world who have what we call dual-use expertise, but expertise that could easily equally easily be used for peaceful civilian applications or for nefarious purposes, um, and work with scientists around the world on uh, collaborative programs that, uh, at the end of the day, enhance our ability to prevent, detect, and, and countries' abilities to prevent, detect, and respond to infectious disease threats. And so, um, you know, I, I started on the bio, I was part of the biosecurity engagement program. I was primarily responsible at that time for expanding this program for the first time into Sub-Saharan Africa um, and establishing partnerships with uh, scientists and institutes um, in East Africa and South Africa and West Africa, um, also managing some of the legacy work in Russia and the former Soviet Union, um, and beginning to expand partnerships in Southeast Asia and specifically um, in Malaysia. Um, and that, that period was fascinating because I began to learn very quickly what we now think of as a spectrum of infectious disease threats, where you have um, human health threats and natural threats on one side. These are infectious diseases that through zoonotic or other processes enter the human population and cause um, disease and death. Um, and an example of that would be, for instance, what we are living through with the COVID-19 pandemic. On the other side of the spectrum, you have pathogens that are used in um, research and in laboratories around the world that 
could be obtained and exploited uh, for the development of um, biological weapons. And this could be uh, sort of perpetrated by either um, countries, states, um, or uh, non-state actors. And then somewhere in the middle of this, what I'll call threat spectrum is uh, lab accidents, um, which is, you know, uh, any, uh, in order to protect the public, the health of people in countries around the world, um, countries need to invest in public health capacity, and that includes laboratories that handle dangerous pathogens. So making sure that facilities that handle dangerous pathogens do so in a, a safe and secure uh, way uh, and don't lead to inadvertent um, outbreaks, epidemics, or, or even uh, pandemics in their surrounding communities or in the world. And so um, it was really through uh, this work um, and, and also uh, President Obama's focus at the time at um, coordinating, developing a coordinated approach to how we combat um, infectious disease or what we call biological threats um, that I was pulled into a lot of White House-led um, processes, processes that were led either by our National Security Council um, or by uh, my, my office, the Office of Science and Technology Policy, that bring together all of the different departments and agencies in the executive branch that are working to address different aspects of infectious diseases on this broad, um, wide threat spectrum. Um, and so I think you know, a lot of people, uh, particularly in the science and health arena, um, think the only department that works on infectious diseases in the U.S. government is the Department of Health and Human Services, and they do, and they do a lot. Um, but literally every, almost every department and agency of the executive branch has some role to play on addressing infectious disease threats, whether that be the Department of Defense or the State Department or Department of Homeland Security. Um, even our U.S. Department of Agriculture that focuses on plants and animals, yep. um, a lot of the infectious disease threats that pose severe um, uh, uh, consequences for humans uh, first arise, circulate, and then jump from animals into humans. And so you need a coordinated approach. So it was really um, because of my involvement with this important program at the State Department that I was pulled into a lot of processes aimed at coordinating that vast spectrum of work. And again, not just domestically, but also making sure what we're doing internationally is all sort of working toward mutually re reinforcing goals. Um, and it was really through that experience that um, I, I just built a lot of partnerships that ultimately led the State Department to loan me to the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy um, from 2013 to 2015. And you know, upon uh, arriving here in OSTP that first time, um, my my world kind of expanded in a major way because until that point in the policy world, I'd just been focused on foreign policy, things that happen outside and off of U.S. shores. Um, and uh, my, my role and responsibility uh, at that time was not just international, but also domestic. So essentially any science and technology issue um, related to infectious disease or chemical threats. Um, and so uh, I came to the White House at that time wanting to um, uh, uh, focus on combating one urgent area of infectious disease threats, which was the threat of antimicrobial resistance and antibiotic resistant bacteria. Um, and we made a lot of uh, important progress during the Obama administration on those issues, including developing the first ever national strategy, um, working with the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology to develop a really bold uh, set of recommendations for how to, in a comprehensive way, combat antibiotic-resistant bacteria, and ultimately the executive order that President Obama signed that directed the executive branch to do more in this area. So really proud of that work, but I think what you find very quickly uh, when you come to the White House is that at, uh, in many ways it's a crisis response organization. So you may have things that you want to make progress toward, but ultimately you'll you're being pulled into um, help address um, unexpected events that happen um, while you're here that relate to your area of technical responsibility. So soon after I arrived at the White House, um, President Obama was sent ricin letters uh, back in 2013, so was immediately pulled into assisting with that effort. Um, some may remember the series of laboratory incidents that happened in the summer of 2014 with 
um, the discovery of smallpox uh, vials at, in, at, at, uh, on the FDA campus, um, uh, the uh, uh, 60 or so employee, CDC employees that were exposed to potentially live anthrax um, and uh, uh, flu uh, experiment that somewhat went somewhat awry, um, all in a quick, succe quick succession during the summer of 2014. And so um, I mentioned that in particular because that was really the set of events that prompted us to take to really reassess how we were viewing, uh, well, the confidence we had in, in our biosafety and biosecurity practices. Um, and so at that time, um, Dr. Holdren, who was the OSTP director, um, and uh, Lisa Monaco, who was the Homeland Security Advisor, um, we combined forces, OSTP and NSC, to essentially issue a set of directives um, to the U.S. science community um, to bolster safety, uh, lab safety and lab security um, at U.S. facilities. Um, as part of that process, we also recognized that some of the assumptions that we had made about biosafety um, associated with some of these riskier uh, research experiments, so these experiments involving dangerous pathogens, that um, we just didn't, we, we, we didn't, our, our calculus had shifted because of this series of events and our understanding of the relative biosafety risks. And so it was really that that led um, uh, us at the time, really led by, by me, to develop what became known as uh, a pause on research involving gain of function pathogens. Um, and I will, will note the, you know, the, the term gain of function has broad uh, implications in biology, but for the purposes of this pause was really focused on a defined subset of research that involves um, essentially increasing the pathogenicity uh, 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 and transmissibility of uh, flu, uh, MERS, and SARS. So a very defined subset of research that we thought propose, uh, posed uh, disproportionate risks to human health. Um, and that was the research that we decided to pause, again, um, uh, as a reaction to the series of uh, lab incidents in the summer of 2014, while we took a step back and reassessed our policy architecture um, to ensure that we were doing everything we, can we could to maximize the benefits of this research or this kind of research while minimizing the risks associated with this research. Um, and oftentimes uh, uh, when the federal government is pursuing, uh, you know, policy changes in particular areas, we don't do it unilaterally. We call on groups of external experts to offer the federal government advice with, on how to proceed in this area. Um, and during that time, it was no different. So we instituted this pause on research so that a deliberative process could ensue that both involved uh, external experts offering the government recommendations on how to proceed and the executive branch to, um, accepting those recommendations and figuring out how to, how to proceed from a policy perspective. And so there were two key stakeholders that we turned to at the time. Um, one was um, the body that was created to offer the federal government advice on issues related to biosafety and biosecurity, which is the U.S. National Science Advisory Board for Biosecurity, um, the NSABB. Um, and in, par in parallel, we turned to the National Academies, and um, they convened stakeholders, um, again, in these mutually reinforcing sort of parallel and complementary processes to facilitate broad uh, U.S. and global science stakeholder input um, that could inform how the federal government um, approached uh, this, this policy and strengthened this policy area. Um, and so it was really that process that I got up off the ground before uh, departing OSTP in early 2015. Um, and it was really my successors here in OSTP that uh, sort of saw that deliberative process through and then ultimately um, spearheaded the development and release of what we now know as um, the uh, p uh, Potential Pandemic Pathogen Care and Oversight Policy, P3CO, that was released by OSTP in 2017. Um, and then uh, HHS released uh, an implementation policy, essentially, uh, the, the following year. 
So maybe I'll pause there and see if there's uh, if there are any uh, areas of that you wanted me to emphasize. But that 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 deliberative process uh, taught me a lot just about the policy making process. Um, and happy to talk about uh, any particular areas that might be of interest. Yeah, no, I, I just wanted, yeah, the reason I brought that up, I just wanted to emphasize not just the um, the specific work, which obviously gain of function, which is, you know, a hot topic and and that you had, had, a, had a deliberate process around that you had to bring all of these different um, components of the government together to, to think about it, because like many of these issues that you're involved in, these are novel and uh, it really takes... Uh, uh, a multidisciplinary uh, approach to think about them. Um, no, I, I, I appreciate Andrew, what, what you laid out there, and, and the um, I think what you know where I'd like to go before we before we get into OSTP per President Biden administration. I just wanted to stop one other place because I again in, in taking this path from your HIV work to gain a function, and now the, the next place I'm going, once again, I really want to just profile uh, your your overall capabilities. I, th I think, personally, you're, you're amazing with all these things you have to uh, to ultimately think about and, and the ramifications of these different technologies. And, and so one other place before going into OSTP um, current uh, is your Stop at Nuclear Threat Initiative, because here, um, you know, there are obviously two, two roles of this organization, nuclear and biological threats. Um, and during your time at NTI, uh, you published another fascinating paper. And this one was um, uh, in Nature Ecology Evolution, February, 2021. And the title of this paper is uh, Safety and Security Concerns Regarding Transmissible Vaccines. And this is one I didn't know much about. Um, and here dealing with really novel animal vaccination strategies where the vaccine can ultimately transmit through a population like the pathogen. And, and you know, this one got me thinking because I had um, uh, Lin-Fa Wang uh, from Singapore on a show about a year and a half ago talking about his work in, in vaccinating all these horses in, in Australia against Hendra virus and, you know, preventing, once again, stopping that zoonotic uh, potential there. Talk a little bit about that. Like, how did this one come on the table? If you can introduce a bit about what a transmissible vaccine is, because I think most people are probably unaware of it. But again, talking about this a novel area that, hey, you you have to think about for the first time and bring the right minds together on how you deal with uh, an evolving technology of this nature. That's great. So maybe I'll bring, create a just small bridge between that Obama work at OSTP and in NTI, and then yep. we'll devote a little bit of attention to that that work on um, transmissible vaccines in, in animals. So um, uh, I mentioned that I had been loaned to the uh, OSTP from the State Department. Uh, the, usually that's for a period of a year or two. So my year and a half uh, came up. Um, and I had to, to decide what I was going to do. Um, and, you know, after a lot of discussions and searching, I realized that I just really, the, the mission of the State Department really just resonated with me. So I ended up going back to the State Department and working for a brief period, about a year, um, not focused uh, exclusively on biosecurity and biological threat programs, but also chemical and nuclear security programs. That was an awesome opportunity to learn more about nuclear and chemical uh, security. I worked for a short period, just under a year, in the uh, office of the Science and Technology Advisor to the Secretary of State. Um, and that was really an interesting period because the mission of that office at, at the State Department was to really look at um, how emerging technologies and advances in emerging technologies really intersect with foreign policy. And so it was looking at um, emerging tech like quantum and AI, and in my case, biotechnology and specifically CRISPR um, genome editing technologies and looking at implications for our foreign policy and our treaty architecture and where there might be gaps and trying to figure out how we could strengthen our foreign policy approach to both address maximizing the benefits, but also addressing the risks associated with some of the applications um, of these emerging technology domains. Um, and finally la uh, landed in uh, the Office of Science and Technology Cooperation at the State Department, which manages and oversees U.S. international science and technology uh, cooperation. Um, and this, what this means, practically speaking, is that we manage the treaty architecture that facilitates U.S. government collaboration on science and technology with foreign governments. And we have about um, 60 uh, formal uh, science and technology agreements that facilitate this kind of collaboration. 
um, a lot of my focus during that time um, was uh, managing the US-China science and technology uh, relationship. Um, and a lot of um, our work at that time sort of uh, uh, contributed to and produced what we now think of as research integrity and research security, really trying to address um, looking around the world and recognizing that there is a growing uh, phenomenon associated with the illicit and illicit uh, misappropriation of, of technology um, and finding ways, uh, recognizing that we need to work with international partners, but finding ways to work with international partners in ways that, again, uh, maximizes the benefit in advancing our own science and technology um, interests and addressing um, really urgent um, transnational challenges that affect not just the United States, but the rest of the world, while also being wide-eyed um, about some of the risks associated with certain kinds of cooperation um, and to the, the uh, extent possible, um, either eliminating risk or mitigating risk so that um, uh, we were pursuing cooperation that fundamentally was in our interests. Um, but it was in 2020, after doing this work for several years, that just an opportunity to um, um, think about infectious diseases and importantly, from my perspective, learn what the unique um, approaches and levers were um, outside of government that could be brought to bear to combat infectious disease threats. So that, I think more than anything, um, that and the fact that it's really kind of an extraordinary group at the Nuclear Threat Initiative. Um, it might sound odd as an infectious disease scientist and someone who's focused on infectious disease threats to go to an organization called Nuclear Threat Initiative. But um, the, while the organization focuses mostly on nuclear security, a uh, small but mighty group of about 10 or so um, have a dedicated uh, a program that's dedicated to combating infectious disease threats. Um, and so really, the, you know, while it was, while I love my uh, um, work in the executive branch, I love working in the government. Obviously, I ended up coming back to the government, but um, what drew me to the NTI position um, and, uh, and, and role was just the opportunity to see what um, kinds of resources the non-governmental sector can bring to bear to combat U.S. and global uh, threats. Um, and so I spent a year um, working at, at NTI on a range of issues. Most of my time uh, was focused um, on uh, trying to rally um, um, uh, uh, stakeholders around the world on accelerating biosecurity innovation. So oftentimes um, our, uh, uh, our thinking about biosafety and biosecurity can be locked in based on what we know, but the reality in the biotech, in the bioscience space is that um, that work is advancing and accelerating at a, a quickening pace every day. And so our challenge is keeping our finger on the pulse of the advances and updating our thinking about risk so that it actually matches the advances today and the advances of tomorrow and isn't stuck in sort of an antiquated view of what, what the true challenges are. Um, and so a lot of my work at NTI was working with stakeholders around the world um, to accelerate biosecurity innovation and address biotechnology risks. Um, but a, a, a portion of the work was thinking through um, how to develop uh, systems that again, can stop outbreaks before they become epidemics and pandemics. Um, and when you really think about how to approach that, um, recognizing that at least 70 to 75% of the uh, threats that, are, that could create potential pandemics in humans arise first in animals and jump from animals to humans, a natural approach to trying to stop those outbreaks from becoming pandemics is to stop the pathogen from jumping from animals to humans in the first place. Um, and if you think about how to do that, you could the, the idea of transmissible vaccines becomes very appealing because we have technologies um, that can vaccinate animals like humans and create durable immunity that will protect them from getting infected. But oftentimes the source of um, zoonotic uh, infections, meaning infections that jump from animals to humans, is not uh, infections that jump from domesticated animals, which are much easier to vaccinate, but infections that jump from wild animals that are much more difficult to vaccinate. 
So, you know, it's really that recognition that's um, uh, prompted a lot of creativity in how you go about doing this. And one of the ideas that's emerged is this idea for um, transmissible vaccines, which essentially is a vaccine that once administered can be passed from animal, wild animal to wild animal, just as a function of interaction. And so, um, like many things, and you probably heard me say this uh, several times over the course of the last hour, at the end of the day, at the end of the day it's about maximizing benefits and, and minimizing risks. Um, and, you know, as we look at these technologies, while they hold great promise, um, uh, these kinds of transmissible vaccine technologies, we just don't know how to control in a way that gives us confidence that they couldn't lead to secondary effects that could pose um, uh, similar or even greater challenges. And so um, while I'm hopeful that in the future we find ways to better um, target, deploy, uh, and deploy these kinds of um, really interesting technological approaches, um, we're just not there yet. Um, and hopefully in the coming years we'll, we'll be closer to considering this, uh, these kinds of approaches, again, in a way where the benefits outweigh the, the potential risks. Excellent. Excellent. So, Andrew, you, you're back at OSTP now under the uh, President of Biden administration. Um, I watched you a couple weeks ago on the White House webinar, uh, annual report of the American Pandemic Preparedness Plan. Um, and while obviously the pandemic's a big part of things, there's a lot more health and life sciences stuff happening right now. We saw the announcement of the, the U.S. Biomanufacturing Initiative, the Cancer Moonshot, ARPA H, a, a lot happening. Talk a little bit about sort of what your day is like uh, and sort of what goes on, how you decide the priorities. You know, you come in the White House in the morning and have your coffee and get to work on things. But there's, it seems like there's quite a bit under the health of life sciences purview. Take us through a little bit of what happens on, on any given day in, in your world now. Yeah, so um, in many ways, it feels like we're in, a, in the midst of a renaissance of like bio and health and life sciences with just all, well, I guess at the end of the day, the top priority the president and the administration have, have placed on um, these, um, these technologies in these areas. And part of that is a recognition that we're in the midst of a, a pandemic. And so we need to urgently work to, develop our capabilities to ensure this never happens again, but also uh, looking down the pike um, at um, just trends in emerging technology and importantly, the potential for um, health and biotechnologies and biotechnology applications far beyond the health sector to other sectors like energy and agriculture and the environment um, just hold tremendous economic potential uh, for the United States and the rest of the world. So. I think it, uh, there are probably other reasons as well, but these are at least two important reasons that have led the president and the administration to really uh, focus on uh, uh, concerted action uh, in all of these areas. What I can tell you is uh, when I uh, rejoined uh, OSTP under President Biden uh, in April of last year, really the first six months of our work uh, uh, was um, uh, responding to President Biden's directive on day one of the administration in Executive Order uh, 13987 um, that directed a broad review of biopreparedness uh, policies. Um, and so there have been there had been a set of reviews underway to look at the policy architecture governing the full spectrum of threats related to infectious diseases. And I think what we recognize very quickly is that the vulnerabilities, well, the lessons that we've learned from COVID-19 um, and the vulnerabilities we face to future pandemic threats were so acute that we needed, and, and the time horizon on developing those capabilities was uh, several years that we needed to get to work um, urgently now. And so we spent several months um, uh, during those uh, first months in OSTP developing and ultimately releasing in September of last year um, what's now known as the American Pandemic Preparedness Plan. Um, the American Pandemic Preparedness Plan, we call AP3 for short. It's a core element of our national biodefense strategy. Um, it outlines um, essentially 12 goals organized around five pillars um, that ultimately are aimed at taking epidemics and pandemics off the table as a threat to society. Um, 
the at the scientific heart of the AP3 plan um, is the really bold and audacious goal that it is within our reach to develop safe and effective vaccines within 100 days of the emergence of pandemic threats. Um, when you look at the just the uh, accomplishments the scientific community made at really compressing uh, safe and effective vaccine development from what had been the record before COVID of about four years to the 314 days it, it took us to develop um, safe and effective COVID vaccines, we recognize we could build on that success. And we think it's within our reach to have this capacity to develop safe and effective vaccines within 100 days. But it's not just transforming our medical defenses. This plan also is working to strengthen our early warning and our um, monitoring systems for infectious disease threats in the human population, for building core uh, capabilities for strengthening U.S. and global uh, public health systems. Um, and so uh, from, uh, from our perspective, this has become our roadmap um, and really created the blueprint that's guiding a lot of OSTP effort and work um, uh, in this administration. Um, and so you mentioned the one-year anniversary uh, webinar that we hosted uh, last, a couple weeks ago, I think, at this point. And um, in conjunction with that webinar, produced a report that began to articulate the progress that we've made over the last year. And while we've made substantial progress, there's still a lot of important work to do. Um, and, um, you know, we, we continue to work with, uh, across the administration um, and with Congress to secure the resources we need to really uh, achieve the full set of capabilities outlined in uh, the BOLD AP3 plan. Um, so maybe I'll, what I'll also say before I describe sort of day in, day out, um, is that over the last four months, I mentioned, you know, during my first tour in OSTP, you come with an idea of what you want to do. In my case, it was prevent future pandemics but you quickly get, uh, recognize that you will be pulled into whatever event demands your expertise. And so that event for me, at least over the last few months, has been um, the emergence of monkeypox in non-endemic countries around the world. And so I've been a part of, uh, since day one, of the White House-led monkeypox response effort that was initially uh, led uh, by Raj Punjabi and Hillary Carter at the, our National Security Council, uh, but then with the appointment uh, by President Biden of Bob Fenton and Dmitry Daskalakis, um, since August has been under their leadership. Um, we have recently launched uh, the global uh, monkeypox response, which is led by senior officials at the U.S. Agency for International Development. And I mentioned both of these because um, my role in these efforts have been um, driving research to accelerate the U.S. and global uh, response. Um, and so uh, <clears throat> part, part of what we aim to do this time is something that we had not been able to do in past outbreaks, which was to develop and importantly publicly release a sort of unified uh, U.S. government perspective on what research priorities were, not only to drive federal research, but importantly, to um, unlock resources that exist outside the federal government um, to address some of the most critical gaps in our knowledge about monkeypox infection. Um, and so on July 21st, we released the U.S. Monkeypox Research um, Priorities Agenda. That was followed uh, on August 11th uh, with um, a White House fact sheet summarizing federally funded monkeypox research. Um, and we have I've continued to focus over the last um, several weeks on both um, securing the necessary funding to do this important research um, and also improving the transparency that we have on a lot of the specific research projects underway so that there's a, a, not only a broader awareness by key stakeholders outside of government, um, but also to facilitate, um, uh, you know, stronger science, stronger engagement between the federal and non-federal um, uh, stakeholders. Uh, in sharpening this research to address, again, our most critical knowledge gaps uh, with the ultimate goal of uh, accelerating the response here in the United States and around the world. Um, so the, uh, maybe the, the final thing I'll say, because it's a substantial part of my time, is, again, I mentioned the, the broad biopreparedness review that the president directed on day one. A component of that 
um, has been looking at the, the um, policy architecture that governs um, dual use research of concern and life sciences research involving uh, potentially pandemic pathogens. Um, and so like um, our approach in the Obama administration, um, a first step to looking at opportunities to strengthen this architecture, uh, we turn to uh, the National Science Ad Advisory Board for Biosecurity. So in, I forget the date, February or March of this year, um, we re-energized the NSABB with the specific tasking um, to offer the government recommendations on how to strengthen our DERC and P3CO policy architecture. Um, that process has been underway. There have been several uh, meetings uh, since we uh, re-energized that earlier this year. Um, and I believe that group is on track to provide recommendations back to the federal government um, later this year. Um, and again, that will inform our thinking and approach to how we um, maximize the benefits and minimize the risks associated with uh, dual use research of concern and gain of function uh, research. So those are um, sort of my major areas of focus, but you asked a simple question, what's my day in day out look like? Every single day is different. It's what I love about this job. Um, you know, uh, it requires you, you know, I think the people that excel, not just uh, here in OSTP, but in policymaking in, in general, um, have deep expertise um, and a, a deep desire to want to translate that expertise into uh, meaningful uh, impacts uh, for the United States. Um, and, you know, generally uh, uh, in, in this world, the, the kinds of skills that really help you excel are um, clear communication, both orally and writing, an ability to collaborate with others, an ability to see a single issue from many different perspectives, and an ability to recognize consensus amidst a sea of disparate views and voices, um, and an ability to um, energize um, different stakeholders across different sectors um, in support of making progress toward defined goals. Um, so those are kinds of the characteristics, but the way, you know, way my day, normal day manifests itself, um, there's a lot of um, uh, collaborating, a lot of meeting with um, uh, 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 my counterparts, not only here at the White House and the National Security Council and the Domestic Policy Council and the Office of Management and Budget, um, not just meeting with my counterparts, but keeping our leadership here at the White House updated on uh, developments in our areas of responsibility. Um, working with um, all of the, the full um, breadth of expertise on infectious diseases that exists across the executive branch at all the departments and agencies. That comes in the form of what I would call bilateral meetings, uh, meetings with discrete agencies on topics. It comes in the form of what we would call interagency meetings, bringing together multiple departments and agencies together uh, with the goal of reconciling views and defining a way forward. Um, it involves engaging stakeholders outside of government, in the private sector, and in civil society. Um, and you know, I think uh, you know, I think what I what I love about um, the unpredictability of my days, which isn't always a good thing, I will say. Like having a little bit of control and a little bit of consistency, at least in my life, is a good thing. Um, but it just gives you the opportunity um, to really work with a diverse array of people um, to devise hopefully impactful and enduring solutions to some of our most urgent domestic and global problems. And so for me, um, you know, couldn't imagine a more satisfying and fulfilling role and truly looking back, taking this opportunity to look back, a truly um, fulfilling um, and rewarding path. You know, along those lines, um, you know, as we talked about, you know, some of the uh, technologies like the gain of function, like the transmissible vaccines and, and the way of the thinking problems of dual use and so forth. As we, as we see here in September 2022, what 
technologies get you excited um, in looking for, whether it's pan managing pandemics uh, and thinking about things like pan vaccines or based on your, you know, your, your previous research, um, immuno-oncology, uh, are you interested in silico and artificial intelligence tools, which are, you know, merging together with some of what's happening in the biospace now? What, uh, what gets you excited? What are the things you think about when, you, you know, if, if, if you're back in the lab today and you start starting out again, what, what types of things do you would they like to work with? Yeah, well, the funny thing is, um, so I'm going to have to actually run here shortly. Okay. Um, but um, if, I think at the end of the day, there are people who are visionary looking down the pike 50 years and really excited of the potential of the thing that could emerge in decades. Um, and then there are more practically minded people that are trying to take technologies and actually apply them for real world, world impact. I think I am solidly in the latter camp. Um, and the things that really, really excite me um, right now um, are not just things like um, taking, uh, uh, like really fully embracing the 100 day vaccine goal and applying it across the 26 uh, families of viruses that are uh, pose uh, human health threats so that we can essentially, again, achieve this really bold goal of taking epidemics and pandemics off the table as a threat to society. But really building on some of the progress we made with COVID where we now have um, people who know they can they have the capability to do testing in their home, rapid tests in their home, mm -hmm. and use that testing to make really important decisions. So um, a key area of focus, it's probably not super exciting, but the, the exciting potential for me is just the unleashing the democratic power of rapid testing um, and empowering people to, to use these tests in ways that um, allow them to make the best decisions for, for themselves, their lives, and their health. Um, and the other thing that I am super energized about these days is uh, wastewater uh, uh, testing. Sure. Um, it has provided, like we knew, the potential. And when you think about infectious disease monitoring in, dem in democracies, we've seen some of the challenges associated with that, not just in the United States, but in other countries around the world. Wastewater testing seems like a way for us to have insights into disease spread at the population level that are consistent with some of our fundamental um, democratic uh, principles. And so, you know, we've seen how it's been so helpful as we've expanded wastewater testing for COVID. Um, we're in the process of expanding that for monkeypox, which I'm confident will lead to important insights that we wouldn't otherwise have. And we've already seen just in the last um, couple months, the importance of wastewater testing for um, detecting the silent spread of polio uh, yep. here in the United States. You know, we did have a, a single polio case, but I think wastewater testing is giving us deeper insights into the spread of infectious diseases that we just wouldn't otherwise have given a reliance on our on other um, existing systems. So it's probably not a comprehensive list, but those are the, the things that come top of mind and just looking forward to maybe come... Uh, maybe in a couple of years, looking back uh, and just looking at the progress we've made at, at taking these technological tools and really translating them for um, uh, really meaningful and enduring impact here in the United States and uh, for uh, partners around the world. Outstanding, really outstanding. Um, for everybody that's going to be listening to this particular episode of the show or, or watching on our YouTube channel, uh, again, you've been listening to the amazing Dr. Andrew Hebler, Principal Assistant Director, Health and Life Sciences, Office of Science and Technology Policy at the White House. Andrew, uh, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come talk to us for a little while about these issues. Obviously, thank you for everything you're doing there to, to keep us safe. And as we say on our show, thanks for helping to create a better tomorrow for all of us. A really wonderful story. Ira, uh, thank you so much for the invite to participate, and thanks for everything you're doing. Uh, as a kid that grew up in Kentucky that didn't know any of these kinds of careers existed in the universe, I am sure the work you are doing is going to connect people uh, in all, all corners of our country and around the world with just an idea for how they can channel their interest and their expertise in ways that they just never knew existed. So thank you to everything uh, you're doing as well. Really okay. sincerely appreciate it. That's the goal. Be well. Good seeing you. All right. Take care.